Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about a little bit about science fiction, but also just about uh, future narratives in general. Um, and I think uh, in talking about this, we need to think about just how difficult it is actually to talk about the future. And uh, in the past, a lot of people have sort of said, okay, yeah, the future is really far away from now. We have some idea of what it's going to be like. We have some idea of history. But usually in a lot of science fiction literature, for instance, um, there's been this idea that, okay, there's an apocalypse at some point and then we'll rebuild from there just because it's just too hard to really uh, consider what the future is going to be like. So the question of what the future is going to be like and what do we have to do to get there? The second part of that question is really quite difficult. The uh, progression from now to the future is really hard to think about. And so what I'm going to try to show through this talk is that uh, not only do we have to start imagining what the future we want is, but also to start about thinking uh, about how we're going to build it and actually do it. It's not going to be some, we don't have to wait for some apocalypse and then re rebuild afterwards. We actually have to start getting on with it. And so I'm going to talk about that through, as, as Alice said, some science fiction um, and defining science fiction. And then I'm going to talk about uh, architecture. I think actually architects are really um, quite specially placed to talk about the future, especially the near future. We, we're uh, specialists in thinking about how things are going to happen within the next five, 10 years and how we actually build it. Um, thirdly, looking at bridging the gap between now and the future. Again, that's the, the question of how do we actually get to this future that we're imagining. And as I said, what if it doesn't start with an apocalypse? What if, what if it's not a, a cataclysmic thing, but rather a more gradual one? Now, before all that, I wanted to um, introduce why I started thinking about this. And uh, a big part of that was these two books. Um, and you may have read these. They're, they're phenomenally uh, successful and popular, um, especially Sapiens on the left, um, both by Yuval Noah Harari. And I think what's incredible about these is Sapiens is a history of mankind. It's a, a humankind, I should say. Um, and it is a way of looking at the world um, where uh, Harari has gone through and explained history, explained evolution in terms of a, a sort of narrative. And he does the same thing with Homo Deus, but looking into the future. So he is doing this form of science fiction. He is taking the uh, available data about um, the technology we have and extrapolating that into the future. And interestingly, his history is the same thing. He's, we have some information now and he's extrapolating backwards. But what's so fascinating that he discovers in both of these books is that the most important thing for um, human culture is that we live in societies based on collective narratives. So that's money, religion, uh, the idea of society at all, the idea that we should all uh, wear clothing and not murder each other. They are narratives and stories that we tell each other. And so you could imagine his books are even a form of these collective narratives. And so the reason I was starting to think about this was because of Corona, because of the whole reason that we're doing this virtually. Um, and there's this very fundamental uh, question that we've had since, uh, since the invention of money, that uh, there's a finite amount of money and that there's only a certain amount of, of uh, resources to go around. But when uh, Corona came around, there was this feeling like we just have to do something about it. And, you know, it might seem very obvious, the Bank of England prints money for the UK government. They do that all the time. But this was a case where they would just sort of said, well, we'll just print more money, we'll just do more of it. And now, I, you know, I, I'm not saying that they've done a fantastic job uh, with, with the money that they've been given or with the advice the UK government has, has uh, put public, but this does put a serious question on this collective narrative that we've um, told ourselves for a long time, that of capitalism, essentially. And so while we start to um, reevaluate some of these collective narratives, I think there's some real opportunity to start to uh, design them and shape them to what we, we want. So I am gonna start with science fiction 
and there's two aspects to that, of course, science and fiction. So you've got data, information, technology, and then importantly in these fictions, it's what will, what will this mean? What will this information, this empirical fact, whatever, mean when people get involved? So there's a, there's a sociological aspect to it. Um, and so th there's these two aspects on either side, and then of course there's time. So we are saying over a certain amount of time, whether in Harari's case, it's uh, to the past or to the future, what happens with this, this information that we have, and especially with what I'm going to look at, uh, what happens when you uh, involve people is incredibly important to our understanding of, of the future. And I'm going to argue that a lot of what we've talked about uh, in the past has actually been the information part, the, the science part. So again, information about science and people extrapolated into the future. We have to assume what's going to happen eventually. And there's two broad um, groups of, of science fiction writing, um, and especially in world building, and those are utopia and dystopia. Um, and utopia is, is a, an idealized place. Uh, Sir Thomas More invented it in 1516 in order to talk about a, a world in which Catholicism allowed uh, female uh, priests. And uh, in, in many ways, he thought this was a great place, but he also called it a no place. It's, a, it's an impossible place to exist. It's, a, it's an ideal that is never achievable. And equally, dystopia, a bad place, uh, was invented by John Stuart Mill in order to win a, an argument in Parliament, essentially. Um, but these two definitions, I think, are really, really important for how we think about the future. Because on the one hand, you have this ideal that you can never achieve, and the other, you have a, an automatic dystopia, an automatic uh, apocalypse, an automatic uh, negative that we shouldn't actually necessarily be striving for anyways. So in fiction terms, in narrative terms, you have a utopia, which is a fundamentally good future in which a hero works to keep it that way, keep it pleasant, keep it uh, peaceful. And a dystopia is where you have a fundamentally flawed future in which a hero works to try to fix things, rebels to try to fix things. And a really good example of a dystopia is Star Wars. You know, the Galactic Empire is this horrible place in many ways, and Luke Skywalker goes and tries to fix it. And the challenge with this kind of narrative is that it has to happen again and again. There's, there's a, it, fundamentally, you have a power imbalance where there's always going to be this horrible thing that you're then fighting to do something about. So in Star Wars, this has been a repeating theme. There's never really, okay, we've won, we've defeated this bad guy, now let's actually start working on the utopia. And now the thing is, this is actually the most popular form of science fiction writing. Most writing, most uh, movies, most uh, ideas about science fiction are dystopian. Now, all, many of you will have seen some of these uh, movies or read some of these books. They're very popular. On the other hand, we have utopias. And utopias are a little bit more few and far between. Star Trek, I think, is a phenomenal example of a utopia. I promise I'm not going to just talk about Star Trek and Star Wars all night. It's much more uh, than that. Um, but Star Trek is really interesting because it is a utopian society where everyone gets, to get, gets together and is very nice to each other. There's a federated alliance. Uh, there's no food. There's no money. Everything is taken care of. It's all an idea. Um, and we don't necessarily have, an, uh, have a concept of how we got to this amazing future uh, world, but there is this really utopian background to it. And so even for the first cast, you know, you have this relatively diverse cast. You have Uhura, who's named after uh, Uhuru, a Swahili word for freedom, which was used by Black Panthers as essentially a, a rallying cry or a, a protest cry. That's really forward for the original Star Trek cast. I mean, it's quite impressive. Uh, you know, there's other problems, not uh, least to mention Captain Kirk's uh, pretty poor acting. But uh, there is some real positivity to it. And uh, at the very least, it got us things like the sliding door and uh, cell phones, mobiles. Uh, these are things that first appeared in Star Trek and then were later um, built upon and actually built in the real world. But the, the, the thing with utopias is that it's generally not that interesting as a narrative. It's um, you're, you're keeping the status quo. In Star Trek, you know, there's this great federated alliance and everyone is just trying to work to keep it that way. There's a bit of exploration perhaps, but usually it's peacekeeping. Now there are some of these other examples, but 
you know, you've got Aldous Huxley's Island here, you're probably much more likely to have read Brave New World rather than reading Island, because it's frankly a better book um, and it's more interesting to read. So there's this fundamental different, uh, difficulty in science fiction in talking about the future because we start with generally a dystopian future. So whether you have a fundamentally good future, it's just not that interesting. Usually you have a flawed future and you're trying to fix it. So again, to come back to this idea of science, time, and people, um, you have these three uh, subjects, three, three uh, parts to the equation. And time, I think I'm going to argue, is, is quite important to this because we've used it as a distancing mechanism. We've said, okay, this is in the future at some point, we don't really know what's going to happen. The problem is we're getting to the point already where we're passing some of these issues. So these post-apocalyptic um, narratives are already happening and they certainly are past in terms of their narrative date. Um, but we're starting to find that some of those, uh, those dates, those deadlines are already passing and we're not necessarily actually doing very much about it. We're sort of waiting for the apocalypse rather than trying to pre prevent the apocalypse. And so this, this uh, subject of time, I think, is quite important, and especially when we start to look at architects. And as I was saying earlier, um, architects are generally quite good at predicting the future. I mean, I think uh, it's generally very near future. And uh, if anyone has used a construction program like this before, um, we're not necessarily, you know, perfectly accurate. Uh, and often it's actually a project manager who's developing these uh, timelines instead of us. But we still are thinking about a near future and then actively working towards building it. So I'm going to look at a few different examples of uh, architects and designers working towards this idea of like, what is this new world going to look like? What is the future going to be? And I think actually, bizarrely, one of the best places to look is Disney. And um, this is the Epcot, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, um, part of the Tomorrowland uh, portion of uh, Disneyland. I was originally built in 1955 and then Epcot expanded in 1967. And of course, features a monorail, um, which I won't uh, give my rendition of the, the Simpsons episode, but it has this clear idea of this is the future, this is going to be great. And the future that they imagined didn't come around. And now they're actually uh, demolishing all of Tomorrowland and trying to actually um, redefine it as this retro futurist idea because it's been, uh, it hasn't come to pass. And I think one of the main reasons for that is that what we were focusing on when we were designing these things was technology. Um, you know, plexiglass is, is great and all, but what does it actually mean when people get involved? I think that aspect of, sort of science fiction and, and the future wasn't as, um, as examined as, as could have been. So you get this vision of the future where the materials might have changed, but broadly, this is still a bourgeois apartment. And when you start looking at um, some of the more arch architectural, or in this case, more engineering examples, it still um, focuses quite a bit on technology. So Buckminster Fuller had certainly had some ideas about um, how society might change. But if you look at things like the Damaxian house, most of the things that they're describing are you know how the uh, water storage works, how the gas accumulation tank uh, occupies part of the house. In many ways, you could say the automobile is more radical in this drawing than the rest of the the, the design is. And I think as we move on, you know, to some of his other projects, things like his geodesic domes, he was much more interested in. Uh, geometry, technology, than he was in how we live in this, beyond you know, how, how you could occupy a house with sloped uh, roofs and walls. This is still broadly a, a single family dwelling. Um, slightly more radical, but still very technologically focused, is the biosphere that he built in Montreal, uh, which later, uh, about a decade later, burnt down. Um, it was just the cladding that burnt, but it, it still, it, remains as this shell, but the, the cladding has uh, been removed. And I'm not necessarily arguing with him because, you know, he's, uh, his building burnt down, it's a shame. Um, but theoretically, when you look at how he's uh, formulated this idea of, let's just, you know, encapsulate the world in this bubble, um, 
the only sort of social aspect of that might be that we don't necessarily have to deal with weather as much. You know, we can, uh, the, the sale of, of jumpers can go, uh, can go way down and we can focus on some other things, but there's not necessarily actually that much of a social, um, many social ramifications or social thought go, gone into this. Uh, I mean, th another uh, version of looking at this biosphere um, in New York City would be to say, basically he's only encapsulated some some portion what about when uh global warming does actually cause a huge problem and there's a big fiscal division between inside the dome and out i think that is generally a much more difficult thing to think about but then also much more important much more relevant so mainstream um architectural criticism put a lot of emphasis and i know rain abandon is just one example but there was a, a big push for quite a long time in looking at technology um, as the central portion of, a, of, of what architecture is and what the future is going to be. This is an anatomy of a dwelling, um, a house is, or a home is not a house. Equally, um, he has this, again, bubble um, where apparently the, the utopia is that you get uh, three naked Rainer Bannums um, in a bubble together, which is I mean, maybe that's your, your vision of utopia, um, nice bearded guy, um, but it's not necessarily that different beyond not wearing clothing. It's still a, a house, again, slightly angled roof. Um, a bit more radical is the, the Super su uh, Surface by Super Studio. Um, and I think there's definitely a social aspect here in a sort of hippie-ish, um, uh, less reliance on uh, on materiality, perhaps, but there's still the sense that uh, technology will will save us um, without really um, defining what what bits it will sort of save. What uh, and, and I'm not saying that I'm uh, an expert on this by any means. I think there's probably uh, quite a bit of social critique here, but I think there's still quite a an, uh, an emphasis on um, a technology to make us comfortable almost as if it was a spacesuit rather than necessarily changing um, how how we live um, a more recent example of that is Mazda and you know Norman Foster and partners um, and an entire city which looks at uh, smart cities basically and looks at says saying if technology is the answer what's the question um, let's try to shove in a whole bunch of, of tech and, and make something work. And, and um, you know, they tried quite early on to involve uh, cradle to cradle design um, and some quite forward thinking design, um, but no one really lives here and no one is really uh, occupying this. And I think, again, there's this social aspect of uh, that, that has been overlooked. Um, for instance, in this case, you, it's really hard to develop a city that doesn't evolve. You, you need a city that actually has a reason for people to come and uh, a reason for, for people to start living there and slowly grow together. You can master plan something, but just building something based on technology might not be the, the right way. Um, so in my argument, in, in this case, we're looking at a real emphasis on science uh, over people. And another example of that that's slightly uh, different is the Earthship movement. And what I find really interesting about these is that they are completely off the grid, uh, isolated communities, communes, that sort of thing. But again, and I'm gonna look at this in, in a bit more detail with some more science fiction examples later, um, the people aspect of it has been sort of uh, left to the wayside. Um, you know, they've got, they figured out how to deal with their water, electricity, whatever. But they are really quite myopic in how they are viewing the world. They aren't trying to change society, they're trying to escape society. And so, you know, in, in this kind of example, um, you, you have to wonder how uh, people are, are feeling about, uh, you know, Trump being elected, or really, if global warming gets as bad as we think it will, these people being isolated won't necessarily save them. We actually need a more radical, a holistic overhaul in order to combat some of those issues. We can't just run away from them. Now, a very different uh, way of looking at things, and, and in some ways very radical way of looking at things, is uh, Narkomthim, 
uh, in Moscow in 1928, a bit earlier. And obviously this is a, a, a communist or at least socialist um, uh, endeavor, but what they were trying to do was to radicalize um, living, basically communal living. And this wasn't necessarily doing anything too radical um, in terms of its constructability. Um, it used relatively basic uh, construction methods and maybe some reinforced concrete that was a little bit uh, new, but predominantly what was interesting about it was that all the, what they described as the bourgeois activities of, of uh, reading and socializing and playing were broken apart into this, uh, this glazed volume on the left of the image and actually a recreational field at the top of the building. So in section, all of these dwellings were um, reduced in some ways to their uh, minimum requirements and then of privacy and that sort of thing. Uh, and then communal elements were brought into this glazed cube uh, or onto this roof. And I think what's fascinating about this and where, really where architects can come into this so much is um, that this is a relatively simple uh, application of architecture, but it's a total revisioning of what the social aspect could be. So I, I want to now talk about how this can sort of progress into the future and how we can start to look at um, addressing the future now, essentially. And I think what's really important to think about this is the stories that we tell about the future. Because currently, one of the main stories that we tell is one of scarcity. Uh, 1972, the limits of growth came out and that bit of information um, was then extrapolated into the future. It basically said, we have a finite number of resources. And then the story that was told about that was that we are running out of everything. Um, and the reaction to that was, let's hoard as much as we can um, to ourselves and make sure that we're, we're uh, okay because we're not gonna have enough for everybody. And that meant that there will definitely be people without, so we don't need to worry about those people who don't have enough because that's the system. Now, a different way that that, uh, that understanding, that piece of information, the limits of growth could have been taken would have been to say, we are currently exhausting our resources and should work in a more regenerative, regenerative matter, manner in order to uh, make sure that our resources are replenished. Or for instance, we should look at distributing our resources. So this is the way we, we went. We sort of said, okay, actually, Let's accumulate all of our resources to a very small number of people. And so the, the same amount of wealth is owned by 62 um, really rich people as is by three and a half billion people. So this story of scarcity, instead of it being, okay, we need to all make sure that everyone is taken care of was definitely some people aren't going to be taken care of. So let's make sure that we're taking as best care of ourselves as we possibly can. Maybe we're not the 62 richest people, but we are, trying to uh, accumulate as much as we can. And what's fascinating about this is that the scale is just completely off. And, and this is in the, the US um, where 0.01% of households uh, have 11.2% of wealth. And graphically, that's just uh, incredible to see. And then at the same time, you think about this redistribution of wealth. Um, this is a, actually a, a Bernie Sanders quote. Um, where it's looking at the richest 1% of Americans is responsible for 70% of all unpaid taxes. I mean, what's, what's amazing about that is that it's just unpaid taxes. It's not an extra tax or something like that. It's taxes that we already have in place that they just didn't bother paying. And uh, that could go to fund tuition-free college. It could protect us from, or it could provide uh, medical supplies for all of our healthcare workers. Um, build half a million affordable housing units. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not American, but uh, I'm Canadian, but it, it's still a, um, a fascinating view of the world. And I think this, this can be extrapolated to the, the, the UK and really um, most of the, of the world. So again, looking at this formulation of science, time, and people, there's been a, a huge focus on science, as we've seen, and the we sort of let the story of, of what's happening to people go a little bit. We've sort of let that be, be told by Reagan or you know, by, by Thatcher, for instance. Um, the political story, the political aspect has really gone in a very different direction 
whereas we focus mainly on, on science. And I think I'd like to um, again bring up this, this idea of where we are within this projected apocalypse. We, we keep on thinking, you know, eventually there's going to be this big apocalypse and then we'll do something about it. And as an example of this, I'm going to talk about Octavia Butler. And um, she has written some absolutely incredible books, um, but I'm gonna focus on, on two, um, The Parable of the Sower and The Parable of the Talents. Uh, Kindred is also spectacular if you haven't read it. Um, but The Parable of the Sower especially is really, really interesting because she essentially, she imagines this world uh, not so far in the future, this is written in 1993. She sort of is talking about the 2020s, so, so now. And she's talking about this world where a, um, a, a very rich white man is running for president, and he, I quote, is trying to make America great again, um, specifically by trying to uh, weaponize or utilize religion and uh, division to convince people to, to work for him or to, to vote for him. Uh, so incredibly um, prescient of Octavia um, and some real uh, interesting ideas around uh, resource management and, and scarcity. And I think one of the best parts of her apocalypse is that it's very gradual. It's not necessarily this apocalyptic moment. It's really, she just sees it as an extrapolation of what's going on already. Um, and what's special about this book, I think, is that it's written in 1993. Um, and to put this in context, the LA riots uh, and the beating of Rodney King happened in 1992. So I'm not saying that she wrote this in response to this, but I think what's quite fascinating about this is that you could argue um, that her utopian vision, or dystopian vision, I should say, is an extrapolation of a world in which um, her people are already, <laughs> are already undergoing a dystopia and already undergoing a, an apocalypse. And I say her people, I, I, I don't think that that's actually um, black people. I, I think that, that her people is, um, and obviously there is uh, a lot of racial issues there, but it, it is a, um, the minority, the, anybody who'd be having any uh, dissent. But especially, um, of course, there's this incredible subjugation of black people in the States at this time and globally. Um, but I think there's also a push in certain respects to saying um, we actually all are going through this, this apocalypse. And so she takes this moment and starts to talk about how you could build a better society. And so in the parable of the sower, she uh, creates this incredible commune, essentially, or earthship, as we were looking at before in, in architecture. Um, where she creates this community outside of, of uh, the normal society and tries to escape this, this sort of formulation. However, she comes back to it in the parable of the talents, which is a, a biblical parable, of course, is the same as the parable of the sower. Um, and the, the overarching idea of the, the parable is that uh, if you have some talent, you actually need to uh, spread it as far as possible or else it will be wasted. And so what she's saying with that, and what she says with this book quite effectively, is that by forming a commune and trying to, uh, or an earthship and trying to be away from society, that was bound to fail. And actually you need to make sure that you're changing all of society and uh, convince everyone to rise up together. So again, as, as I say, it's not necessarily just about um, a single race, it's more about a, um, an entire community of people trying to create a better world and trying to create a world in which there isn't uh, as much injustice. And I think one of the really interesting quotes that I've read um, during this Black Lives Matter push um, was about how uh, this, this person was saying that they didn't want equality within the system that was already broken. Our, our system is so unequal with patriarchy, with, with misogyny, with uh, inequality in terms of uh, monetary uh, equality anyways, why would, why would we want to uh, make sure that uh, Black people were involved in that? Actually, we actually want a way better ver uh, world for all of us. It's quite empowering. But the point that I wanted to make with these is that um, I think she already realized that we are in the midst of this apocalypse. Things aren't going that well 
and that you know it sort of feels like this every once in a while where everything has been getting worse and worse and we're just sort of sitting here saying well the apocalypse will come one day and then we'll fix everything well, actually it, things are getting pretty bad and we already we're starting to realize that more and more but now what do we actually do about it what do we actually start working towards and so another example in this realm is uh, a book from 2017, Kim Stanley Robinson, New York 2140. And what's interesting about this book as well is that it is gradual. It's um, a series of flooding events that slowly New York and the rest of the world is submerged. And basically New Yorkers get on with it. They are slowly adapting and they rebuild their city um, step by step um, to try to create this utopian world and it's not necessarily even utopian it's just they've learned to live in, in balance and so obviously this is already happening you know hurricane sandy knocked out a huge amount of, of the the, the uh, well of manhattan and of the area uh BRK Engels group whatever you think of uh, that firm are already designing and, and enacting this this uh first line of defense the the big u um there's a certain aspect of we need to start doing something about this now and probably actually being much more proactive about things. So the last part that I wanted to talk about is what if it doesn't start with an apocalypse? What if it's not um, a, a, a stopping event? It's more gradual because I think what's quite true is that if, if the future is anything like the past, change will be gradual. This will be a slow disintegration. I mean, Gradual, that might still be quite quick, but it won't be one event that completely changes everything. Even Corona hasn't completely changed everything, but it has ratcheted us one more level towards something different. Um, so I wanted to start with this uh, solar center. Um, now, this is a very small example, but I think it, what is quite interesting about it is that it takes on the idea of scarcity. So this is, um, on the one hand, electrical scarcity is dealt with by using the sun. On the other hand, uh, material scarcity is dealt with by uh, using sand, an incredibly uh, available resource. And what's uh, he basically is creating a 3D printer using uh, just those two elements. Obviously, he has this rig that he's set up. But the thing is, we have this technology. This, this actually should have a date on it. It's I think from 2006. Um, this is stuff that we, we've already developed. I'm not saying necessarily that this is the answer for everything, um, but it is an example of uh, a shift in a paradigm where we're saying, what if we did actually have abundance rather than scarcity? And the thing is, we actually do have abundance. We have, abundant, uh, we have abundance of certain elements and of certain um, resources that we really can start to apply. And so one, one thing that I'm gonna talk about um, in a few sections is agriculture. And uh, my brother, who's a, quite a phenomenal guy, he works um, in developing countries and developing um, agriculture especially. Um, so we, we often have conversations about how you uh, deal with regenerative agriculture and how you deal with self-sufficiency in, in uh, agriculture. And this example is in Cuba. Um, and the organic bonicles, and th this is, I mean, I'm saying that this is an example. It was actually completely widespread across Cuba because essentially what happened um, was in the 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, they had to figure out how to create um, a self-sufficient island, essentially. Now, there's a whole bunch of other aspects that they looked at, um, transportation, um, uh, medicine, education, all that kind of stuff that they had to figure out by themselves all of a sudden. But I think um, the agriculture was quite interesting and a lot of what they did was make it urban, make it local, make it absolutely everywhere. And what was fascinating as well is that they made it all completely organic. So all of a sudden there were no pesticides, which are generally uh, petrochemical based. Instead, they used entirely natural pest, uh, pesticide um, and insecticides. And Cuba is now the world leader in organic agriculture. They still don't necessarily have the same kind of resources to uh, spread it uh, across the world, but they have been able to use uh, their incredibly highly educated populace to create some really, really incredible situations. And the part that I find interesting about it is that it is a sustainable 
um, practice. And, and this is a very uh, basic uh, concept, but crop rotation going back even, even much further, uh, specifically with indigenous populations is another um, example of uh, of regenerative practices. You know, you have this very simple crop rotation that not only produces a massive amount of agriculture, but then reinvigorates the soil and, and adds nutrients to the soil um, throughout the, the growing process so that the, the resource isn't minimal. It, is, it isn't scarce. It isn't uh, finite. You can keep doing this literally forever. Another example of, of that slightly different is the Goebel in Amsterdam, where a uh, brownfield site, um, completely contaminated site, is actually being regenerated through these basically agricultural practices, but then also using, um, on the right of the image, those are all boats that have been uh, moored on, on, the, uh, on the shore, essentially for use as offices on the left. It's a, a bar and restaurant. And they're using this, uh, these very basic bits of technology, but a very uh, sophisticated use of social uh, technology, you could call it, um, in order to revitalize this site and to actually um, regenerate this site. Another example closer to home is growing up uh, underground. Again, I don't necessarily think that this is the answer for everything, but it does have a certain sense of getting on with it. It's, it's a, um, an idea of we have these resources, we can actually just, um, we can do it now. This is the future. We're already in the future. We don't have to, to wait for something new. We can actually just get going with it. And similarly in The Hague, they have these, uh, these uh, greenhouses on top of main buildings downtown. They're incredibly productive. The, the Dutch are um, spectacularly um, advanced in their agriculture and, and obviously have um, uh, utopian ideas about wearing shirts and uh, being in, in the middle of greenhouses, but they're really, really productive. And I think uh, this is uh, Wageningen University in Holland, where they have a very particular interest in uh, bringing people from all over the world to understand these agricultural practices and bring them back to their, their own countries. And their focus is still a little bit technology heavy, but it is a, an idea of understanding uh, plant life that is very um, sophisticated. Food is a very basic problem, um, but the Dutch have sort of figured out how to produce a massive amount of it. And they produce, um, despite their size, they produce as much as uh, the United States, for instance. Um, it's a really incredible feat for something for a country so small. You know, it's not even, uh, I think, a quarter the size of, of uh, the UK, and yet they're incredibly productive. Now, of course, these ideas have um, have started, and like people are talking about this kind of stuff. And there's this fantastic book that uh, obviously the Architecture Foundation had a um, a hand in. Um, called Gross Ideas, and it was part of um, a, a biennial, an Oslo biennial, talking about degrowth. And, and I think this book contains some really fascinating concepts of, um, of what the future would be like. Uh, Steve Webb does a really great uh, version of the future where all roads are, are replaced with canals uh, so that you can deal with, uh, there's basically no friction in water, so you can move massive amounts of stuff, but there's less, it takes longer. Um, but I think uh, my argument here is that degrowth is not necessarily the right narrative. Now, I think we are, have been uh, growing and said, saying that growth is a huge, uh, huge part of our um, society and that that is definitely an issue. But it's not necessarily about degrowth. It's about growing in the right directions and, and within a, a, a certain set of boundaries. There's certain planetary limits that we have to live within. And especially as I was talking about, if we have regenerative growth, it can work quite um, well, can basically work infinitely. Now, this is a, a, an idea of donut economics, which is unfortunately named, because uh, it just sounds a little bit sillier than it really is. It, it basically looks at all of these different um, ideas of, of both social and, and ecological matters and says, these are the limits on, on both sides. We basically, we need a certain amount in order to have a social foundation. And we, the, the planet can only uh, allow so much. So in order to meet our needs, we need a certain amount of water, certain amount of food. Um, and beyond that, 
we will cause climate changes in this uh, situation. Or, you know, we need, in order to be a good society, uh, need to have enough housing and enough gender equality, um, for instance, but too much of that, I don't know how too much of gender equality would be a problem, but uh, how much too, housing for, too much housing, for instance, could cause biodiversity loss and, and is causing that biodiversity loss. However, we could change the way we do housing and still allow for um, housing enough people. Um, two last slides, almost there. I wanted to actually end on this very um, optimistic idea from 2006, um, which I find fascinating because it um, is very optimistic, but also not very um, hippie-ish, essentially. Um, it is a very green idea. The, the basic idea of it being that you could create um, a, a living wall that actually also added, acted as a battery. So this, you could charge your phone based on the algae growth on this living wall. And what I think is so interesting about that is wet computing. The idea that you could have computers that we've com thought for so long as being um, resource uh, difficult, um, all of a sudden being quite natural. So the way I want to end this is talking about what stories we want to tell about the future. I think these, these stories, as, you know, as I began with, they are the foundation of our culture, and yet we don't necessarily pay enough attention to them. And I think there's a real opportunity for us to start looking at how we bridge the gap between now and, and a brighter future, the future that we actually want. And lastly, how can architects and, and designers um, play a role in building that future? think we actually have, um, we're good at building things. We're good at growth. We just need to do it regeneratively in a sustainable way. So I'll end there and we can go on to discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Um, if you stop sharing your screen, we will see you in your full magnificence. Um, I mean, I was struck, um, yeah, first of all, uh, do pitch questions in the chat box, please, and I'll, I'll pitch them to Andrew. But, but if I can kind of kick off, um, I mean, the, 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 these two um, models of the future, the utopian and the dystopian that you've identified kind of early on in your presentation, and the, it, it, the thinking back on the history of architecture over the past century, certainly the, 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 the early years of modernism, they're, they're quite, they're over, they overlap in quite complicated ways, it feels. Um, you know, one thinks of um, the early years of the modern movement really playing out against the backdrop of Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West being, sure. you know, kind of a, um, maybe the best-selling book in Europe, I think, kind of in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, where there was a sort of narrative about, um, yeah, that, that civilizations have a finite life and that they come to their end, and that, um, that maybe the First World War had signified a, a certain, you know, moment in the in the decline of the civilization we were living in. And one senses that you know modern architecture was one optimistic response to to you know well, what they identified as maybe a call to arms, mm -hmm. um, fascism, perhaps another. Um, and, um, yeah, how, how do you, yeah, do you, are you, I mean, it, it's a, there's a sense in which maybe utopias and dystopias are equally dangerous, um, um, da da dangerous kind of cultural developments. I, I think so. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's a reason that I was talking about utopians still being no place. It's not necessarily a, a good aspiration. Um, I think. Uh, one of the biggest, but at the same time, I think architects tend to be at least on the very basic level utopian. You know, we, we want things to be better generally, or at least positivist. Um, I think uh, the, the challenge has been, um, there has been a huge push towards some form of utopianism through whether it be fascism, um, you know, some fascist people think that they are trying to uh, make a utopian society um, or, or even modernism having a very absolutist um, vision of the future. And I think obviously, as we've seen in, in a lot of postmodernism, 
um, there is an abandonment of any kind of strong opinion one way or the other. And I, I think while that is, I think it's good to not be absolutist, um, I think we still need to be positivist. And I think we still need to be um, working towards something, not just sort of waiting to see how things are going to happen. So generally, you're, you're optimistic, you're, you're, you feel you welcome um, visions of the future, whether positive or negative, as kind of spoke right. well, our imagination. I, yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, um, I think if, if you sat down for a, a cup of coffee with me at, at some point, you've probably had a, a pretty pessimistic version of the future. Um, because I think, uh, you know, climate change has been a, a big subject in, in the household for a long time. You know, there's I, neoliberalism is just such a looming, terrible thing. But that being said, um, I think knowing that those are, are just figments of our imagination, or at least, well, neoliberalism is not, not necessarily climate change, but that the, our, our ability to work as a species um, towards a common goal is, is really exciting. I mean, I think that's a lot of the reason that I started thinking about this was uh, looking at the you know, global response to coronavirus. I think there was a pretty clear um, response in most countries and most societies that human lives matter. Um, and, you know, this has sort of revealed some countries that don't find that uh, as important as, as others, but there has been a real uh, acceptance of the idea that we that money is less important than human lives. I think that's a, at least a bit of a of a pointing pointing in the right direction. And I, th I think what well, you one could tell a story of the twentieth century that was about failed predictions of crises, uh, whether it, whether it was Spengler or Malthusian food crisis or the white tape two K. Um, you know um, the um, kind the of bug, bug, yeah. Kind of, yeah. There, there's a whole kind of succession of them, and and we we find ourselves suddenly living in a moment when actually one of these um, apocalyptic scenarios perhaps has be, uh, become more tangible. Um, yeah, That's how, the thing. We're we're there. We're yeah, in yeah. it. Do, do, does, do you think that was going to change the course of architecture? That that realization. Well, I'm, I'm quite curious as to how, how architecture can move in the future, because I think um, there's been a fundamental shift in, uh, in the financialization of architecture um, in the last decade or so. Um, and obviously, architecture has always been a, a model or a, at least a, an element of, of the financial world, but it has pushed um, much further into that realm. Um, I think what I might say as being um, my only hope for architecture coming into the future is that we have such a broad, uh, broad set of design thinking skills that we should be able to circumvent this system in, uh, in, in productive ways. Um, I'm not quite sure how that's going to happen yet, but I think that there's enough, uh, enough push from government and from other sources that we might have the availability of that kind of resource to, to do good things. I think it's about a, um, a philosophy, designing a new philosophy uh, or a manifesto, however unpopular those are now, um, that uh, brings people together, brings people towards something positive. Um Constantine Coco, I've just unmuted you. You have a question. Okay. Uh, so since there is a problem with video, so I'm not activating my video. Uh, I am an architecture enthusiast and I always wonder if it's possible to create something futuristic, but still sustaining its culture of its place, like typology, I mean, or culture of its city. I hope you can answer my question. Thank you. And yeah, yeah. You're from. You're speaking from Indonesia, I think, Constantine. Yeah, yeah, I'm from Indonesia. Yeah, though your your uh, avatar is from Hamburg. Um, um, I think uh, absolutely. I mean, there's um, a really amazing um, 
uh, portion of science fiction called Afrofuturism. Um, and uh, Octavia Butler isn't necessarily uh, one, of, one of those, but there are some other really um, incredible writers who are starting to look at uh, visions of the future that include a, uh, a real element of um, native mythologies, for instance. And, and um, uh, I mean, which is basically all science fiction does anyways, but there's a, an acknowledgement of other um, of other visions. So you could look at something like Wakanda, um, how Wakanda was designed for the Black Panthers movement, Black Panther movie, um, as being an interesting example of an alternative vision of, uh, of a futurism where the culture is sustained. Now, I, I do think there's definitely a, a version of that in architecture. The problem historically, I think, has been um, internationalism, the international style and, and modernism has basically said there's one version of the future and it's Corbusier and that's that's going to be it. Um, so most people have sort of said, okay, well we'll we'll quiet down and maybe do our own thing, but probably actually try to copy you for for a while. Um, but there's a real element of uh, of localism, of uh, critical regionalism, as as Frampton would call it, um, that is really quite exciting as to how you could extrapolate vernacular things like the, the hutong in, in China, for instance, a really interesting circular form of, of housing into a futuristic vision of the world. Uh, yeah, I, there's there's not a, a huge, huge amount of it happening yet, but there's, there's going to be. Um, next up, we've got Alessandro uh, Colombano, uh, who was speaking last night, a uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, about the post-war architecture of Birmingham, which I'd recommend. Alessandro. Thanks. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah great. Great. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, kind of touch upon the idea of uh, futurologists and futurology as a kind of emerging kind of profession or a job profile. And um, they tend to focus around kind of technology and society and in this, uh, the, the kind of intersection between them. Um, I just wanted to kind of see your take on, on that as a new or emerging kind of expertise and how uh, architects and architecture, how we engage with that, um, particularly when a lot of it's about aesthetics and Afrofuturism has a very strong aesthetic style. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's kind of more of a broader kind of topic for discussion. Yeah, well, I think um, what's what's interesting to me about the futurologists and and that sort of um, I mean it's such a fun catchphrase um, is the, their reliance on technology, but but through that actually there is quite a it's a perverse um, interest in sociology in people. So so much of what they do is looking at um, the data that they can uh, harvest from Facebook, wherever, algorithmically harvesting this data in a way that they, the, the data being human behavior. And I think mm. you're, you're very right to, to bring that up because there's, um, there is a growing interest in human behavior. I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried and I'm hesitant to, to call it a, a positive uh, you know, outcome because it still seems so, um, dystopian to to look at how that data is being used and how that understanding of, of behavior is being used yeah um, that being said i think there's a real resource there um i mean even even just in terms of like politically like one of my favorite examples of this recently was the the trump uh, tulsa uh, rally where uh, a whole bunch of um uh uh korean pop fans bought or bought uh, got tickets for the Tulsa rally mm. um, so that Trump would look like he had a, a completely empty uh, stadium but actually the effect was that he, they polluted his uh, his data the elections data so that they can't use that data set for um, election or behavioral mm. analysis I mean that kind of understanding of how people use spaces and and, um, and how how you can extrapolate a massive amount of human behavior could really be extrapolated to uh, to our understanding of human flow, of uh, how people use spaces 
I think now, um, now that we have track and trace in place, sort of, um, that could be a really interesting way of understanding how people use the city uh, in a way mm. that architects could, uh, could really benefit from. Um, yeah. Especially with offices, stuff like that. The coronavirus has completely changed how we think about offices. How do we understand that human behavior? Well, Zoom is going to be uh, an incredible resource moving forward. I'm sure they have uh, harvested a massive amount of, of data from these kind of, of meetings. I'm sure this one has been very important for them. Uh, to, uh, to understand how the world is going to operate, how directly that's going to work aesthetically, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think um, that, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily that, that important in certain respects.